Good morning. I'd like you to turn to the book of Ephesians, if you would. We'll be in chapter 4. We're going to be looking at the last part of chapter 4. It starts in verse 25, and it runs down to the end of the chapter. And if you know me, that's amazing that I'm going to try to cover that many verses in one setting. But we are going to give it a shot this morning. I did it in the first service. Not well, but I did it. We'll see if we can do it again. And I'd like to read that to you just to give you a sense of this. And what I did, rather than trying to read it on my Bible again, as I put it on my phone, so I have a lit section here I can actually look at. First service was a train wreck. The microphone died. I couldn't read. So hopefully you're going to get the better version of this. Here's what Paul tells us in the book of Ephesians. Therefore, laying aside all falsehood, speak truth to one another. For you are members of one another. Be angry, yet do not sin, and do not let the sun go down on your anger, and do not give the devil an opportunity. He who steals must steal no longer, but rather he must labor, performing with his own hands what is good, so that he has something to share with one in need. Let no unwholesome talk proceed from your mouth, but only such as is good for building up what is needed and what will give grace to those who hear. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and all anger and all wrath and shouting and slander be put away, along with all malice, and instead, be kind to one another, tender-hearted, graciously forgiving one another, just as God in Christ has graciously forgiven you. That came out a lot better, didn't it, Caleb? When you can see the wonders of the world are available to you. I want you to hold on to that first word there. It says, therefore. Now, there's always a reason to have a therefore in the text, and I'm going to get to that. I want you to understand why Paul says these things need to be done. But at first, I want to ask this simple question. Did anybody have any trouble understanding that passage? Was that a tough one? Okay, we're not plumbing the depths of predestination versus free will. Well, I'm not trying to explain to you the nature of the Trinity. We are talking about some very basic stuff. Paul says, if you're lying, knock it off. If you're stealing, stop it. If your mouth is full of foul words, time to change. This is basic stuff. But I want you to understand this is very critical to us. And Paul is presenting something here we need to understand in full context. And that is simply this. First off, let me put the context for you. Paul's passage is here is entirely in the command form in the Greek. This is not Paul coming alongside and encouraging you. Paul is not saying it'd be a really good idea to try this. Why don't you do this for a change? Paul is saying this stuff needs to stop and it needs to replace with this and you need to do it now. Now is the time to change. I also want you to understand everything he's talking about here is not conduct, not just conduct, it's character. And I hope you see that as we deal with this. He's talking about a change in the very nature of what you are. What you are needs to be different than what it has been before. And Paul is trying to lay that out for you. These things need to change. There needs to be a contrast between the, what the world is and what God's people are like. And it needs to be a contrast that is so striking that no one can miss it. That's what he's after here. That's what he's laying out. And I want you to understand why he feels so bold that he can lay orders rather than suggestions. If you have not gone through the book of Ephesians or if you've not studied it in depth, I want you to understand the book is a very simple breakdown between two parts. Chapters 1 and 3 and chapters 4 through 6 have two distinct realities to them. In chapters 1 through 3, what goes on there is Paul says, this is what God has done. God has changed the whole game. I, I, if you go through that first three chapters, it is stunning. He has blessed you with all blessings in the heavenly. All of them. Everything you need for life and godliness has been provided. 
God has transformed what you are. He has blessed you with everything you are going to need. He has given you every resource to be a different kind of person. And once he has done that, then starting in chapter 4, Paul then says, let me start here looking at the beginning of chapter 4. Paul lays this out. It says, therefore. Remember that word, therefore? Very important word, therefore. Because God has already done all of this. Because everything in your life has been transformed. It is different than what it was before. Therefore, as a prisoner for the Lord, I urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. Did you get that connection? You need to be consistent with the calling to which you have been called. This is what God said you have to do. Now live up to it. And I can tell you to do that with no uncertain terms because God has already equipped you and made you able to do that. That's the beauty of this book. That's the power of it. That's what God has changed. God has made you new. He said this in 2 Corinthians, Behold, all things are new. You familiar with that one? That's where he sums up. All things are new. That's my favorite theological word. If you know me, that's my favorite theological word. I found this early in my Christian life. I looked very deeply into the Greek while I was in seminary, and I found out that the Greek word that is translated as all means all. That's a very good reality to hold on to. We have been made new. Now, I understand in our culture it's kind of hard to believe we've been made new because quite honestly, as we look at these things, we're a little jaded. We, we have a very commercial-centered culture, don't we? How many times have you heard a product that's promised to be new and improved? Now, I put the next question to you. And having bought that product, how often have you found that it wasn't all that new or all that improved? That's a reality for this. I, I just had that brought home to me, uh, to how much we claim products do. Uh, I go to the gym in the morning, and... Uh, if you've ever been to the gym, all of the machines you're on, if you're rowing, if you're on the elliptical, if you're doing the stairs, whatever you're doing, it's all pushed so it's facing a wall filled with screens. You watch a lot of stuff, you really don't. There were uh, Hispanic uh, soap operas, you know, there was the old Charmed show on it. Like, do you have nothing that's worthwhile? And what they had on the big screen was in a constant loop, a recurring commercial for a robot vacuum. Three weeks, that thing was on a constant loop. I know more about the shark robot vacuum than I ever wanted to know. You know what I found out? It is the best robot vacuum ever made. It keeps the edge, edges better than any robot vacuum ever did. It goes into the corners better than any robot vacuum ever did. And it's got a very special bar that hair doesn't get tangled in. From what I can tell, it may be the pinnacle of human achievement, surpassing the moon landing, new and improved. I even know how many ping pong balls it can pull up through a tube. I... It's a nightmare. I wake up seeing ping pong balls. It's... But I want you to understand, when God says everything is new in your life, that God has changed the dynamics of who you are, that God has turned you into something new and different, He means it. There really is a newness to your life. There has been a change between what you once were and what you are. And He makes a call to live differently. This has always been the hard for us. The hard thing for people to understand what's going on there, that God wants a different kind of person, not just a person with a list of better rules. The world's religions always dealt with rules. That was the thing. Jesus addressed in the Sermon on the Mount, chapter 5, verse 20, he says, your righteousness must surpass that of the scribes and Pharisees, or you will not inherit the kingdom of heaven. Now, in our world, when we always talk, the scribes and Pharisees are the bad guys, right? Right? That's how we see them. We, we see them as, as just being, they're, they're evil. We know that they're hypocritical. But I want you to understand how they were seen in their day. By human standards, no one had ever created a religion 
that was more rigid, more demanding, or more moral than the Pharisees. It was the toughest list of all time. Hundreds of minute and involved rules, I mean, down to how heavy a woman's brooch could be on a Sabbath morning. It was crazy. And when Jesus said, your righteousness is going to have to be better, I want you to understand where their minds went. They're going, how many more rules can you add? How much harder can this get? That's not what he was talking about. He was talking about the reality that their rule set never addressed what you were. It only dealt with some of the things you did. It never addressed motive. It never addressed character. And what God was going to change is what you are. That's the difference that we have. God is going to change what we are. Turn us into something different and give us a character we never had before, a capacity to live a life we could never live. That's the distinction we have. That's the reality we're supposed to have. Understand this. There's a reason people like to write lists of rules. And what is tragic to me is the number of Christians that they, they do the same foolish thing with rules. We look at the world and we just want to be enough better so that we feel better about ourselves. I want to be better than they are. And we have a list. If I'm doing this, I'm going to church at least three times a month, and I'm giving this much to the church, and I, I went to a weeknight Bible study. I mean, that's big points of God, isn't it? If I went to a weeknight thing, and we, we have all these lists that tell us this is what I've done that God has to be impressed with, it's rules. And I want you to understand something, how shallow that is. Because our culture, the morality of it has gotten so bad that quite frankly, the list of rules you need to look better isn't all that high a bar to clear. Look at our surrounding culture. What they are, being better than that, isn't much of an accomplishment. And God's standard has to do with what you are. I want you to understand. The character of the believer should be so different that the comparison is shocking when the world looks at your life. It should be stunning in its contrast. People should not be able to miss that something has changed. You are a new creation. I think we sometimes miss that. We get stuck on this idea of, of just sharing a gospel that says God has a wonderful plan for your life, and we don't talk about the reality that God also has some demands on how you live that life. That there are expectations that we must meet, that we are to be a different kind of person. I've had people tell me this before. They'll say, you know, the there's just some people that have accepted the gospel, but they, they just aren't, they're just not ready to make a commitment to follow Christ yet. And, you know, they're saved, but, you know, they're just not ready yet. I can't find that in Scripture. The gospel contains a message that is called repentance. Did anybody take a shot? What does repentance mean? To turn away from the direction you're going and do what? Go in a new direction direction. How can someone look at the seriousness of sin? How can you understand what Christ had to sacrifice to save you and think that he is going to be satisfied with you saying, I'll take the forgiveness, but I have no intention of living the life. And I've had people tell me, well, you're talking about a salvation by works. I'm not talking about a salvation by works. I'm talking about a salvation that works. It actually changes a redeemed person. A redeemed person is something new that can live differently. Am I saying that sin just stops? No, don't be ridiculous. I'm not saying that it doesn't different for some of us. It's harder for some of us to change. I'm not saying that some of you had greater difficulties to overcome in transforming that life. Sanctification is a process, but it's a process that needs to start the day you are saved. It is time to move in a new direction. If you just jump up ahead of that chapter in chapter 4, 
and start looking there in verse 17. It says this, Now I say and testify this in the Lord, that if you trust no long, that you should trust no longer in the Gentiles and walk as they do in the futility of their minds. They are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them. Due to their hardness of heart, they have become callous and have given themselves up to sensuality, greedy practices of every kind and impurity. But that is not the way you learn Christ. You see that? You learn something different. Life should be different. I like the last sentence on that. And to put on the new self, that right there, verse 24, created after the likeness of God in our righteousness and holiness. The new self. You are different. And Paul understands that you are different before he asks you to act differently. Ask, no, before he commands you to act differently. If you claim the name of Christ, your name should mean you are different. Your conduct should be different. Here's something I, I, we don't like to think about. When you became a believer, God did not ask you about this. He just did it. He puts you on display before a watching world because he wants someone to look and see what a redeemed person looks like. You have been put in the showroom of life. God has done his greatest miracle. This is bigger than anything else you want to talk about. He has transformed a life from death into life. He has turned you into a righteous individual. And he wants the world to marvel at that accomplishment. You are on display. The question is, what do people see when they look at you? And Paul is saying they need to see something different. Now let's go into this. What's supposed to be different about us? How much change is there? We can look at that very first verse there in chapter 4 and verse 25, and it says this, Therefore, laying aside falsehood, speak the truth one with another and with his neighbor. I'm going to ask you this. Can you think of anything that would be more transformative in our culture than if suddenly everybody started saying what was true I mean, come on, we're in an election year. Can you imagine how different it would be if the candidates actually answered the questions they are asked in the debate honestly? First off, if they just answered the question they were actually asked. Because of, I don't know if you have noticed this, but it seems like they asked, and you're going, you go, I have no idea what this has to do with the question that was just asked. But imagine how that would transform things if they told what was true. It would be entertaining, to say the least. Well, tell me, Senator, uh, there's been accusations that you actually have a foreign operative, a Chinese communist spy on your staff, and that you've received up to $10 million in graft payments. <laughs> no, Megan, that's not true. There's actually three communist Chinese spies on my staff, <laughs> and the number is much closer to $70 million. I can be bought, but I'm not cheap. Can you imagine that? Well, why did you change your position? Well, because I actually have no convictions of my own and I want to get votes. Lying is baked into the very character of this culture, of this world at large, but especially here. The truth is simply not part of our values. Truth is not a value of this country not a value of this culture in any way. The entire world system is based on lying. Here it comes when politicians lie. I don't mean to shatter your illusion, but they do. Doctors lie, and that's in spite of the Hippocratic Oath. We actually have doctors now, and we're seeing the stories come out of behind the scenes that they are really not interested in health care. They're interested in the fact that some of these movements that are going on, most especially this transgender thing, means a lot of money for doctors and hospitals. They don't care about those children. 
they're going to make a lot of money. And they admit it in their meetings. They didn't want the videos out, but they are. Teachers lie. I'm sorry to say this, a lot of pastors lie. Salesmen lie. And we are supposed to be different. There's supposed to be something uniquely different about us. Can you imagine how different our commercials would be if they didn't lie? The information they lay out to us, they didn't lie. This world is so ingrained in it. I, my, one of my, my first degree before I got out of college and headed for seminary was in cultural anthropology. You can see how valuable my degrees are for living in this world. Uh, cultural anthropology, and you learn about a culture, they say one of the things you want to study is their language. And how many words they have to talk about certain things will tell you their values. You've heard the old adage of how many words Eskimos have for snow because of the big... Now, how many words do we have for lying in our culture? Think about a few of those. We exaggerate, which means you lie. It's a fish story. What's a fish story? It's a lie. It's a white lie, which still means it's a lie. It's even in the, it's in the term. I mean, we, we don't hide it. Obfuscation, procrast, uh, prevarication. We have a billion different things for this. The reality is flattery is often lying. We don't mean it. We're just trying to manipulate somebody. Exaggeration is lying. Uh, we do a whole series of the often excuses, quite frankly, are lying because we don't want to get caught for what we know we've done. We have a whole series of things. Because lying is baked into our very hearts as something so normal, it doesn't bother us anymore. I'm really convinced of this. You may think I'm crazy, but I've been watching this world, and I've been watching speakers that, if you notice, that people can come out, last week they said this, and next week they're on the camera again saying something completely different. And they have no compunction about the fact they're violating, they're completely contradicting what they just said like 10 minutes ago. How do you get to that state that you can do it on camera with recordings and have no sense of having done anything wrong? I really believe our culture has come to the point that we lie so frequently that it doesn't register to us as a lie anymore. That's how we can say things like your truth and my truth. I have become the arbiter of writing truth to a point that I can just make it up as I go and think I'm right in doing so. That's the nature of lying. Of course, if you're really good at it, you understand this. The best way to lie is to put a little bit of truth in it. And that's why I found this. In our election year, the best lying that is done by both sides is done by using statistics. Yes, the old adage is, facts don't lie, and figures don't lie, but the people using them lie like a flat rug. They lie. I've been listening, for instance, to this. There's been a whole lot of reporting that actually the economy is great. Inflation is under control. Wages are up. Employment is up. You are doing better than you ever had before, you whining, complaining people. What is wrong with you? How dare you say it's harder to make a living? How dare you say it costs you more? Except for the fact that when you go to the grocery store, what do you notice? It costs you more. I don't even look at the gas pump anymore. I, my heart can't handle it. I have to wait for the bill to come in and then deal with the Costco card. It is insane what we have out there. I've also heard this one. They, I've been being told that by statistics, crime is down across America's cities. It is safer to live in a major city than it's been in 10 to 15 years. I'm still listening to grins and grunts that you don't buy that. But if you select the numbers carefully enough, you can tell that lie, and you can support it with enough facts to the point you can almost believe it's true. That's the game we play. But we are to be an honest people. I want you to understand how important that is to what we are. I mean, let's, let's think of this through. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. We are given the spirit of truth. 
We serve a God whose name is truth. I don't know about you, but I'm picking up that there's a theme to belonging to God. And that truth, if it's the character of the God we serve, should be the character of the people that serve him. And to what level should that reality of truth mark our lives? Scripture makes it very simple. Let your yes be yes, and your no mean no. How different would it be to deal with someone in life whose integrity was so great that you could trust those two words when they came out of their mouth? What kind of employee would you be if the, your employer could look at you and trust when you said yes or no, you actually meant it? That when you committed to something, they believed you were going to give everything you have to follow through. How would you like to go down to a salesman at the used car lot and have them tell you the truth about the vehicle, exactly how much they're going to make on the deal and why, and deal with you honestly? Maybe your heart couldn't stand that one. This is supposed to be what we are. It says to put that away, get rid of that. The word is apothema in the Greek, and it means to throw it out like you would the garbage. It is something so worthless you shouldn't keep it in your house. It's time to get rid of it. That's our starting point, verses 26 and 27. But I like how this goes on. It starts to build. There's another thing that starts to come up in verses, I should say, that was in verse 25, verses 26 and 27. Here's the next thing you're supposed to do. Exchange unrighteous anger for righteous anger. You see that one? Be angry, but don't sin. Now, I, I want to address this one theologically because I, I recognize that some people that you may have even heard teach disagree with me on this because they're going to say this. If you read the whole passage, if you get to verse 31, it says to put off all anger there. Put it all off. So how can you say there's a righteous anger? Because all anger needs to go. And if it was only the English we were dealing with, they'd be right. But I want you to understand, the Greek has more than one word for anger. In verse 31, the word for anger is thuma, and it's the word we often translate as rage or wrath. And it is saying you, as a human being, should never be involved with rage or wrath. As a matter of fact, there's only one individual in all of the universe that can handle wrath without it corrupting who they are. Do you know who that is? That's God. God, we leave wrath to God. God can handle it, you can't. But the word here, the word here that we're dealing with is a different word in verses 26 and 27. It's not thuma, it's peros gizmos from the word orgidso. And this does not talk about boiling over or explosive anger. This refers to deep-seated, determined conviction. It talks about a sense of justice. That's what this word deals with. I want you to understand, it talks about a sense of what is right and a sense of what is just. Notice what is missing, anything about how you feel about it. Because you know how most of our anger comes up? Because it's about how we feel about it. How dare you talk to me like that? I have my rights. I don't have to listen to that. I, 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 and that's where all of our anger comes from. And God says the only anger you're entitled to is that it is focused on what is right and what is just. And in those categories, you should have a response. As a Christian, as someone who cares about what is right, something should make you angry. Something should prompt you to confront it and say it's wrong. That's your job. You need to be sparked to action by certain things. Now, what kind of things should spark us to action? I'll tell you one, the honor of God. When this world wants to twist and distort who God is, that should bother you. And you should be prompted to action to confront that and say what is true. How about this? When someone twists the word of God, if someone comes up here and teaches what is wrong, that should bother you and you should confront it. And I'll tell you, if some churches in this country would do that, there'd be a lot of pastors out of work. And praise God, they should be. There are things that should prompt you to action, things that should matter to you because there's a truth in this. 
I want to put this out, not to wax political, but let me put something out to you. A survey was taken among evangelical Christians to ask some questions about our view on modern things. And they asked this question, is gender something that can be personally chosen and determined? Now here's the number of evangelical Christians who said yes, 37%. I've read this Bible. Can you find that in there? How did God create them? Male and female. And yet we are actually letting the culture push us in a direction that something so obviously contrary to God's word, we will buy that and make it part of our values. We will help the world to take and drug and mutilate children with surgeries so that they like us rather than stand by what God said is true. Now, I know that's not popular, and if this is going out of the broadcast, someone's going to, we may not make YouTube this week. I'm sorry, Pastor. But that's the simple, do you know puberty blockers retard the growth of the natural human body? Bone density doesn't properly. There are cancers that come to that. The internal organs don't develop properly. The human brain's natural growth is damaged by these drugs. And we call that health care? It's almost as if God was right. Go figure. We need to be angry about some things. There are things that should bother us and we should take action on. I also have this very plain, though, I want to tell you. That anger that sparks you up, that anger as we look at injustice and untruth and we act against it, we confront it, we identify it, we tell the world it's a lie, don't live in that anger. Recognizing it, having it spark you to action is where it needs to stop. Because notice the next thing it says, don't let the sun go down on that anger. You can't live on a constant adrenaline without it turning into something it shouldn't be. Once you have recognized it, once God has prompted you to action, but once that anger has risen, now, carefully, calculating, calmly, determine a course of action and act on it. But don't live in the anger. We have to be different in that category. There has to be distinction in us to walk properly as we should. Not unless another one here that says we're supposed to stop stealing and instead work for a living. Now here's one I want you to look at very carefully because I want you to notice something in this. Because this really shows you where character enters into the picture. It says stop stealing, but instead work with your hands to make a living, but notice what it adds on to that. It doesn't just say stop stealing and get a job. It says Work with your own hands that you might have something to do what? Come on, you're looking at it. Do what? Share. You mean I'm working purposely to have extra to give away? Yes. Now I want you to understand what's involved here. That giving away has nothing to do with giving to the church. We're not talking about giving to the building fund. We're not talking about missions. We're talking about having an excess that you set aside purposely to meet needs that arise. So that when someone has a need, you have the means to help. I want you to try this. You are budgeting generosity. You are working for a margin to set aside to budget to be generous when there is a need. Luke talks about how what the blessing is to share with someone who cannot pay you back. Cannot pay you back. Much less with interest. Do we plan to have money in excess to give away, to meet needs as they arise. Is that a transformation in character for stealing? Because stealing is all about what I want. And now I'm not just getting a job, but I am working for the purpose of putting others and making them more important than myself. Can you see how character is the issue here? This is a dramatic change. Stop stealing. Now, I want you to understand this. There's a lot of things that talk about stealing. If you go into the Old Testament, you'll find that 
not reporting an error in a ledger is stealing. In other words, the scribe has made a mistake in your favor. You're going to get more money than is coming to you. You're supposed to report that. Now, how do you think that affects when you're doing your taxes here? In absolute honesty, these things are stealing. If we are not doing exactly what is right. We pay our taxes. We pay the proper bill. Try this one. If you employ people, Scripture tells us that if you do not pay what you know to be a fair wage for the work, it's stealing. This is all about character, folks. Not just conduct. It's about character. What values are you putting in life? What matters to you? I like this one. This is 2 Thessalonians 3, 10, and 11. But we urge you, brothers, to do this more and more, to aspire to live quietly, to mind your own business, and to work with your hands as we've instructed you, so that you may walk properly before the outside world and be dependent upon no one. I want you to think that verse through in several ways. First off, it says, how about if you stop minding everybody else's business and mind your own? Here's what God starts with. You know, if you have enough energy to be involved in things you have no business in, you probably have enough energy to get a job and make a living and stay out of their business and mind yours. Not only that, here's the character is the world can see you as an honest person who makes their own way, does not demand that others pay their way in life, and it helps your testimony. An honest worker. I will put that out to you. Almost all of us have or do work for someone else. And the character you show in that will be the beginning of your testimony for eight, ten hours a day. What is the attitude you bring to the job? I also like that it says work with your hands. Does this mean that no Christian can ever have a job other than labor? No. It's saying the attitude you have toward work. And I'll put this out to you. Here's one of the problems I'm finding, especially in our new culture coming up, is they're coming out of college with $100,000 in debt and they have an expectation that as soon as they get out, I've got the degree, I should get that new job at $175,000 a year. I'm owed that. And you know what they're finding as they get out of college with these huge debts? That that degree does not guarantee you anything. That you may have to start at the bottom, and it bothers them. It's an attitude you have that says this, whatever I need to do, to have a job to make my own way, to not be dependent on someone else, I'll take that job. It doesn't mean you can't move up and get a better job. It's saying, I'll do the work that other people may think is beneath them because any job, any honest labor is noble. The attitude we have about this, so that I might make my own way and that I might be able to help others. It's an interesting thing. The world's principles, the more you get, the more you got. The New Testament principle is the more I have, the more I can give. That's a very different attitude in this whole thing. The next thing that comes up, verse 29, we exchange corrupt communication for edifying words. For edifying words, corrupt communication. I want you to understand what this talk is talking about foul language by and large. Twisted words, foul words, deceptive words, anything that is not honorable. Now, I don't know about you, but after 45 years at working at Cal State Northridge, I found a, a whole vocabulary of words I had not been exposed to that much before. I knew more about foul language than I ever wanted to know. And I also saw a shift in it. When I started there 45 years ago, it was mostly the men who would talk that way. As time progressed, it became the women, and I'll tell you, by the time I retired, the women were more foul-mouthed than the men. Scripture tells us that it's a bad world when your women get corrupted. You're kind of the gatekeepers, ladies. You're the ones that kind of hold us back from being barbarians. And when you join us as barbarians, there's not a lot of hope left. It's a tragic reality. I like how that puts there, you need to put off this foul language. The word for putting it off is sapros. Uh, it talks about the foulness, the unwholesomeness of it. And the word is used to talk about rotten food. Now, you all should know about this one. When's the last time you went in the refrigerator and you saw that piece of Tupperware you hadn't noticed for a while, and you opened that up and, whoa. I have no idea what that once was. 
that is so bad, I may not keep this Tupperware. It may not be worth cleaning. That's the reaction God wants to that kind of talk. It should be so foreign to us, it'd be like trying to make a meal out of something spoiled in the refrigerator. It should turn your stomach. It should bother you. It shouldn't matter what's going on there. Instead, he says, he names some features of what it should be. First off, your words should be edifying. They should build people up. You should plan what you say to build other people up. Meaning what you say should actually be worth listening to. Is that a novel thought? Gentlemen, I'm going to put this out to you. We're supposed to be the leaders in our home. You're supposed to be able to open your mouth and instill wisdom to your family, to offer them something that will alter their life for the better. That's what the whole book of Proverbs is. It's primarily a father passing wisdom to his son. Here is a problem. If you don't spend any time building up wisdom in your life, how are you going to have any to share? How are you going to impact your family with the truth if you have not bothered to dig in and find out what is true, what is wise, what is useful, what blesses a life? Are you putting any effort into that? And you wonder why your relations with your family are the way they are? It should be beneficial. It should offer something that is different about that. It should be necessary. The next thing it talks about, it should be literally as fits the need. Your translation might, that actually fits the need. There's a lot of things we say that do not fit the need. There's a lot of times we open our mouth and things come up and the question, was that really necessary? That is my most embarrassing moment with my wife. When we are at a disagreement and something pops out of our mouth and she goes, was that really necessary to say that? And my first thought should be, absolutely not, I'm sorry. My first thought is often, well, yeah. Why was it necessary? Because I thought it was clever. And I thought it would put you in your place. And it's not working out. Some things just don't need to be said. There are things that are useful and things that aren't. And the third, it says it should give grace to those who are here. Do you pause and consider how to say something gracefully? to address it in a matter that they're going to respond to. We always hide behind that. Well, you know, what I said was true, but was it gracious? Did you carefully plan to say it in a way that's going to impact the life in a positive way? What did you do? The last section is kind of a catch-all in verses 31 and 32. And he says we need to kind of exchange all our vices for what is good. And here Paul sums things up. Get rid of bitterness, wrath, anger. And here he says, just get rid of them. There's no place for bitterness. But you don't know who I'm dealing with. God does, and he says there's no place for bitterness. And if he deals with you, I think he understands there can be cause for bitterness. You may have earned some from him, but he doesn't give it, and he's not going to let us. Get those things. Set them aside. Be done with them. Have no place in your life. Get rid of them. Stop doing some things. There's a couple of words here I really like. Clamor is a really intriguing word. Uh, you know what clamor is? It's yelling in public. You know those outbursts that were unnecessary? That guy cut you off in the freeway and you're yelling and cussing in the car and shaking your fist. And Did, it, did he come back and apologize? Has anybody ever had that experience? That that helped the situation? Yeah, I didn't. Explosions, yelling it, because we're mad and we want to know how mad we are. This is how stupid clamor gets. See, I'm not going to ask you to show your hand because I don't want to raise mine and embarrass myself. How many of you found yourself yelling at an inanimate object? Yeah. And I'll ask you again, did the object respond by making the situation better? Not once. What's the point? Clamor does not help things. The other one is slander. Clamor is what you do and yell in somebody's face. Slander is what you do behind their back. 
And I yelled at him, and now I'm going to talk about him to everybody I meet. You're all going to know how upset I am. You know exactly why, even if I have to make it up. These things are not to be part of our lives. No bitterness, no malice. Malice is the desire to see someone hurt or fail. I want to see someone just bomb out completely. And I'm going to enjoy it so much when they do. That's malice. <coughs> I just want to see someone fail. An attitude that loves that. It loves the calamity of others. Instead, he says, be tender-hearted and forgiving. Now here, if this doesn't tell you this is about character and not just conduct, nothing does. Here's the level of forgiveness God wants you to show to others. What's the level of forgiveness here in the text? As God forgave you. I'll, I'll let you know something. In his dealing with you, God has never used the phrase, well, this has gone too far, I've had enough. God has never used the phrase, well, I'm just not going to forgive that. He's pushed me farther than I can deal with. We have a standard that says we let things go. And here's the hardest one. We're not supposed to maintain bitterness and malice for a person that never asks for our forgiveness. We're still supposed to let that go. We're supposed to set that aside and not carry that. What Paul is after here is, is character. It's a character that transforms us in such a way that the world can't help but notice. We are the body of Christ. The world only understands Jesus as it sees us and how we interact with one another. As Christ lived in this world bodily once, he now lives in this world through his church, and we are the reality of him that people can see. And what we are should be so different that the world can't miss it, can't ignore it. They can be aggravated by it. They can hate us for it, but they should not be able to miss it. We're to be a people of character because God created us with character. God made us into something that can live differently. Why are we satisfied with less? Let me close in prayer. Father God, we just pray that we will latch on to, to grasp the character, the power you have given us to transform our lives. Father, we need to recognize that character is built in the small decisions, the small ways. Before we can deal with major crises in life, we have to build a character brick by brick by practicing these things, by making them part of who we are so that the world may see. We thank you for that in Christ Jesus' name. Amen.